I'm not really sure I decided. I think I would look at it more of a calling. Uh, one really needs to be called into the ministry. I had realized that I had been involved, I had been involved with, uh, you know, working with people, uh, working with families, um, just doing ministerial work. Um, I remember, because I played it once Dr. Boy, you left, I spent the years, 15 years playing the piano at Goodman Church. And I remember uh, a lady coming up to the piano after the service, she passed right by the pastor and came to me and she said, would you come to my house and do some marriage counseling? And that was kind of strange because um, why didn't she ask the pastor to do that? Mm -hmm. Another lady came up to me and asked me about her grandson. He was, um, I want well, his, I don't want his words that he had eventually confided to me that he was dealing with schizophrenia. So I've worked with some schizophrenia patients. And um, again, she could have, this person could have gone to the pastor, mm -hmm. but they came to me. So I realized I was doing a lot of ministerial work, working with families. And then um, when I thought about the marriage part, um, I said, well, I really can't marry somebody legally. I'm not ordained mm -hmm. and I don't have a license from the state. So I just felt being called into the ministry, not so much that I made a decision myself, and then there was a passage of scripture that I was quite fond of, as said the 58th chapter, verse 7 said, uh, God said, here's the fast that I have for you to divide your bread with the hungry. You know, not the type of fasting where you, you're showing off like the Pharisees did, but to divide your bread with the hungry, provide for the homeless, Covered and clothed and naked, had not your self from the needs of others. And that's something I try to do because that's what I'm, my mother taught us to do. So I eventually sought the counsel of two people, Reverend Henderson, who was our pastor. Now, this is not the pastor that other people walked past and came to me for uh, to counseling, but because we had several pastors, they would last one or two years because they were part of the conference structure. But he was the only minister that was not part of the conference structure. Uh, so he counseled with me and my other main counselor was my home pastor, Reverend L.A. McGee in Kansas City. And it, that was decisive. He told me um, to uh, continue to pray, he gave me a six month study and um, they called, they, he called, uh, I think it was eight or nine ministers, a council of ministers. I would go back and uh, go before this council and be questioned. And um, if I, if they felt I was truly called, they would ordain me. So that happened. Um, I did get through all the questions and the discussion that I had with these ministers. And so they, uh, they gave me two, uh, um, certifications, one to be an ordained minister, but another one was for uh, the state. Uh, I, I shouldn't say the state, I should say uh, all the states where I could minister in every state in America. And that part was important because um, it allowed me to uh, perform a marriage. You can't marry somebody and have a legal marriage if you're not, if you don't have that certificate. It also allowed me to go into um, the prisons anytime I wanted to, because I would go into the prison, I would have to wait till their um, visiting hours. If I would go to the uh, fifth floor, the uh, psychiatric ward at Cooley D, I could only go there at the visiting hours. But with the uh, certificate, I can just go to Cooley D anytime I want to. Mm -hmm. at the locked unit, the uh, fifth floor. 
I can go to the prison anytime I want to and just show my papers and visit with the prisoner. So it gave me those kind of a privilege, privilege uh, with the um, uh, official ordination certificates. But to make it short, again, um, one um, should be um, called into the ministry, should really be sure they hear the voice of, of the Lord. And many do, and they resist it. But in my case, I didn't really resist it because I, I felt I was already doing the work of the ministry. Yeah, well, you know, if you live in a small town like Amherst, um, people began to kind of know who you can call on by, sometimes by word of mouth. Now you live in Village Park. I got a call, this lady never would have called me if she hadn't known a little bit about my reputation. Um, she called me, it was probably around one in the morning and she simply more or less said, Floyd, um, I wanted to, Say, I think I might have told this story. I've told this story before. That it's like, um, I, I wanted to say goodbye to you before I leave. And of course, I'm I'm waking up out of sleep. You know, saying, um, okay, uh, well, you know, goodbye. Have a nice trip. But then it dawned on me that she was saying to me. She didn't say it out. She didn't say it explicitly, but what she was saying that she was getting ready to take a trip, meaning. To kill herself. So, I, I, my goodness, it it registered. I jumped out of the bed. I might have had my pajamas on with other clothes and everything. Rest, got in my car, rushed down to Village Park. But before I got there, the police stopped me because I was speeding. That was a good thing. I told them what was happening. So um, they escorted me to, and they, they called the fire department. They escorted me to the lady's house and they broke down the door, the bathroom door, not the house door. And she had swallowed all these pills. So they rushed her to the Cooley D Hospital. They put this big tube in her nose or her mouth and pumped out her stomach and saved her life. So the point was that um, she called me. She would be dead now. This was um, maybe around 25 years ago. Fortunately, she's doing well. I, I, I'll make a qualification of that statement. She's doing well mentally. She called me on Valentine's Day uh, a couple of weeks ago. We kept up our friendship. She lives in Florida now. Uh, only thing she has. Um, since have gone blind because, you know, if you don't take care of your eyes, get your eye exams, um, it, that pressure can build up. If it gets to be uh, in the 14, 15, 20 range, um, you can go blind or have your sight um, impaired. But anyway, just being involved in the neighborhood, I want to say one more thing about uh, that comes with um, a lot of criticism. Uh, I would get calls from Owen, uh, I'm the God father for children. I would go to her house maybe, you know, 11 o'clock at night. People would not understand that, you know, they would think the wrong thing about it. But I had to make a decision that um, if I'm going to be a minister, I'm going to go I'm gonna let the chips fall where they may. I don't care what people think. I can't uh, do ministry and be afraid that people are gonna say bad things about me. And um, the lady that, um, I won't call her name, but um, she made the rumors that she would always see me with kids in the car and little girls, um, the Sheikah. Uh, Karina, they were little girls at the time, Zanaya, and uh, she put out the rumor that I was a pedophile. And what hurt me most was that I had just paid, um, her daughter was about to graduate from high school, but her daughter owed some money, they wouldn't let her graduate. So she came to me. Uh, people know that they can go to little Floyd, he'll, he'll try to help out. I gave her the money, 
And uh, I told her, so all you, have, you don't have to pay it back, but maybe you could help fix uh, to see her hair, Serena's hair from time to time. And she wouldn't even do that. Spread the rumor that I was a pedophile. What happened eventually, years passed, uh, uh, I would say that Rosa came to my defense. Uh, Reverend Rose said, well, we know Floyd. Um, we have no problem with Floyd. We know that he tries to help people. But this same person uh, ended up in a nursing home. I was playing um, a concert at the nursing home in Northampton. She became homeless. And um, I saw her, I said, that looks like so-and-so. So after the program, I, I went up to her very politely and spoke to her. I didn't condemn her for all the room. I never even brought it up. I just asked her how she was doing. And, um, you know, uh, you can't pay evil for evil. You can't do that. That's um, Romans, the 12th chapter. That's Matthew, the fifth chapter. If people mistreat you, you still try to be who you are. Mm -hmm. and then I have to follow, I'll give one more scripture. I have to follow what I tell other people. Um, Psalm 37, verse six, could be verse six, seven, or eight, that God will bring your righteousness to uh, pass like the noonday sun. All those evil fingers pointing at you. Don't try to put out all those fires. Dr. Martin Luther King tried to do, I mean, excuse me. Uh, when J. Edgar Hoover was talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Dr. King didn't have time to put out all those fires. He had a ministry. And then it turned out that it was Jack Hooper who was really guilty of a lot of gross behavior. They took his name off the FBI building. I mean, they put it back up, but Dr. King knew um, Psalm 37. <laughs> Just go on about your business, do what's right, and God will bring you righteousness to pass. You don't have to put out all those fires.